Welcome into K State Online. I am Mason Voth, joined by Drew Galloway here on this Wednesday with your K State headlines of the week as we hit the midway point, getting closer to kickoff of week two down in New Orleans between K State and Tulane. It's going to be an exciting time as K State looks for their first ever win in their third meeting with Tulane. Everybody obviously knows what took place in 2022. Those, those just ugly and damn painful alternate uniforms. Why, why would you ever wear something different? Come on. You know you're going to lose if you go out there looking like whatever. Uh, I don't really care. I don't really think the uniforms have been a problem. But, again, that's why I suggest that K-State, if they want to break out alternate uniforms again, do it in a game that it would be just incredibly wild that you would lose so like UT Martin last week or – they should have done it in the Sugar Bowl against Alabama. You know, try to reverse it that way. You probably weren't going to win it anyways. Uh, so we'll uh, we'll we'll talk a little bit more about Tulane because there's some interesting things going on uh, with what could happen on game day down in New Orleans. In addition to that, a little health update on K State. Drew will give his optimism there. We'll talk about K State and where they sit in the latest AP poll that came out on yesterday because of the extended Week One. But we start. Before we even give you a headline to remind you of the biggest headline over the week, Drew, I want you to know I've actually started my process of getting my passport uh, hey, hey, for next year for Ireland, a.k.a. I have Googled what I need to do to get my passport. So I actually haven't done the first step of that, but I have Googled it at least to find out. But yeah, unless you've been living under a rock or neglecting your KSO watchings or listenings, K-State is headed to Ireland, and you can join your Wildcats in Ireland as they kick off the 2025 football season against Iowa State in the Aer Lingus College Football Classic. Game tickets can be secured now through a travel or hospitality package. All-inclusive travel packages include premium game tickets, luxury hotel accommodations, and exclusive K-State welcome experience and more. Game day hospitality packages include premium in-stadium hospitality with food and drinks and premium game tickets. Don't miss out on the trip of a lifetime. Book your package now at cats2ireland.com. That's cats, the number two, ireland.com. So get set for Ireland. Uh, just like K-State will kick off the season next year in Ireland. A couple of cats, actually a whole lot of cats, thanks to the work that Chris Kleiman has done recently with putting K-Staters in the NFL, are getting ready to start their NFL season, some of them for the first time. Uh, as week one is approaching, tomorrow the Chiefs and Ravens will kick it off. We know that Felix Anyadike Uzama will be out there for the Chiefs. Hopefully we'll see uh, if he can uh, continue to improve and work his way up. And we'll be joined in a moment by Sasha Bushka, who I used to work with on the radio in Wichita, but just like everybody else uh, that I worked with on the radio in Wichita, has decided to stop working in radio in Wichita and uh, is part of a really awesome new feature is it's an app that you can use uh where it uses all these different analytics to predict mismatches uh that i mean if you're just a hardcore football person you'd be very interested in these but probably more interested if you're a hardcore betting person so we'll talk a little cats in the nfl with sasha in just a second but drew i ask you which wildcat in the nfl are you most intrigued to watch this weekend uh, I mean, as the Chiefs fan, I feel like I have to say Felix DK Uzama because I, I, I'm interested to see his usage this year and how how improved that he's gotten. He showed some flashes in the preseason, uh, but Cooper Beebe is probably the, the second one for me. Uh, as as I put it with uh, some people over the weekend, I, I'm not really like a Cowboys lover, but I want all the all the KC guys to get drafted by the Cowboys because you know they're on TV all the time. It's like you can just find a find a game and oh there there's the K Stater playing and Cooper BB starting at center as a rookie I think is a really big deal and it, it's really fun so you know I, I'm really excited about him uh, the other one that I'm I don't know if intrigued is the right word but Cornelius Lucas just being in the NFL for as long as still he has, I mean wild. it's wild and that's like, not a slight to him but it's just crazy that his career has has lasted this long. Yeah, it, it's a while that it's lasted this long because it's definitely not a slight to him, but it's like I remember him playing at K State like when we were like growing up, and like the fact that he's still in the NFL, crazy. Yeah, so for Cornelius Lucas, if we're doing the math here, this is his eleventh NFL season that he's about to kick off. So he was a rookie in 2014, 
And uh, here he goes. He's hit a decade in the NFL. Uh, look, I, I'm a Cowboys fan, so obviously I'm excited to see the Cowboy Cats. But it is unique because I want to see Cooper Beebe do great things because the Cowboys need to keep kind of retooling their offensive line. But I'm more interested to see, because the Cowboys have let their running back situation get so crappy, what is the usage for Deuce Vaughn going to look like who made the 53-man roster out of camp? Very fascinated by that. I would also throw out there that uh, I'll just be interested to see what the Jaden daniels Ben Sennett situation looks like in Washington. How much run does Sennett get? How does the passing game look with a rookie quarterback? All of that pretty fascinating to me as we get into the uh, NFL weekend. And Drew, you'll have plenty of time to watch the Cowboys or listen to the Cowboys and Browns this weekend because we'll be in the car on the way back from New Orleans. So I can guarantee that I will have that ready to go, especially since you and DY, your teams play on Thursday and Friday this week. So we don't need to worry about catering uh, to what you guys have going on. But we'll, uh, we'll step aside now and I'll bring on Sasha because – uh, I think it's a very interesting uh, thing that they've got going on. I've, I've already signed up and a part of it. I'm already blindly following what they've put forward uh, for, for this week's games and uh, what we're looking at. But uh, this is Sasha Bushka from Field Vision Sports Now, formerly uh, one of the hosts of Wichita's top afternoon sports drive show uh, at KGSO. Now he's with Field Vision. Are you the brains of the operation or would that be your brother? <laughs> the brains of the operation would be like the last thing that I would get described as in, in this. And even, even my brother wouldn't be described that way. So uh, I'm, I'm running content for field vision. Um, and we have some data scientists that I would call the brains of the operation and, and the software guys and all of that stuff. Um, I'm, I'm just the dummy who talks football. So, okay. Uh, well, yeah, well, then let's let's give you some football to talk about. So most of the stuff that people will probably use on the betting side of things will be offensive skill players. So Tyler Lockett, for example, we'll talk about him in a little bit. But w what you guys do with your ratings and some of the analytics you put out also includes guys that impact these offensive players. So edge rushers, linebackers, really anybody on defense that could create Havoc and you use your Havoc ratings and probably one of the most notable players and maybe, I mean, Drew, would we say DJ Reed is K-State's best NFL player right now? Right now, I, I think so. It, it's probably him or Tyler Lockett, but I, I would say DJ Reed. The, the Jets fans love DJ they Reed. They do love DJ Reed, yes. So, Sasha, tell us about DJ Reed and uh, how he might impact some people when it yeah. comes to thinking about, oh, do you, do you test this Jets defense? Sure. First, I have to apologize. I know there's some good offensive <laughs> linemen from K-State in the NFL. We haven't quite cracked that code yet. You guys were talking about Cooper Beebe uh, coming in as a rookie, and we don't chart plays or anything like that at Field Vision. We go off of results-based data from information on the field. But as far as DJ Reed goes, I mean, the guy who gets all the shine in New York in the secondary is Sauce Gardner. Uh, but, but DJ Reed, uh, we had him as the the eighth best corner in all of football heading into 2024 uh, in our, in our 2024 havoc ratings. And we, we use what's called a matchup index to rate offensive players matchups each week throughout the season. But in preparation for creating that index, we created uh threat ratings and havoc ratings. Um, and the havoc ratings are our information on the defensive side of the ball, and they can be cut up in a few different ways. And the cool thing about DJ Reed is he, he's not a one-trick pony by any stretch of the imagination. We have him almost top 20 in both man and zone coverage. Um, and then also uh, number 11 in, in run defense and number 12 in overall coverage. Um, and that it, it's, it hasn't just been like a couple of seasons either. Going back to 2020, he, 2019, there wasn't a lot there. But going back to 2020, He's been basically a top 10 Havoc player in our raw Havoc scores for each of those years, every single year uh, since 2020. And then obviously we take five years of data. We weight it by the most recent stuff first. Uh, and last season was pretty good for him. Uh, he's He is still below his teammate Sauce, uh, but they have a pretty good duo there in New York. Yeah, I think it's just crazy to think about where DJ Reed is. And I guess we probably shouldn't be surprised that he's been able to have so much success in the NFL, considering that maybe one of his best moments at K-State was his pick six of Patrick Mahomes 
uh you know back what would that have been 2016 drew 2016 or 17 yeah, season I think. yeah so i he's he, he's always had it in him but he has continued it on at the nfl level now the other defensive player for k-state that a lot of people are interested in especially because we have a lot of chiefs fans is felix and Yudike uzama and he's a guy that rookie year some ups and downs a struggle to get on the field sometimes but you have at least some minimal stuff to go off of with FAU. What what picture is painted by that? Yeah, so our um, our ratings are split up by position group. Um, so we have cornerbacks, safeties, uh, off-ball linebackers, edges, and interior defensive linemen are kind of our categories on the defensive side. And we um, – let's just face it, FAU wasn't on the field a whole lot last year. So he came in as like 161 in edges uh, for the season last year. Uh, but the good thing about uh, the Havoc ratings is they're dynamic. So if he plays more this year as the season progresses, more data will come into the system. And, and the way we do it is we we have play-by-play -play data from every game with like 200 columns of, of data that happens on every play. And we ran them through a statistical model that determines like what, what stats, what criteria, what things that happen on a play are worth the most value in a play. And then we can use that to – to, to cut the defensive rankings uh, any way we want, whether it be by pass rush, by run defense, by zone coverage, by man coverage, and then we rate the players accordingly. So short answer is Felix and Udige Izama didn't do a ton for the Chiefs last year, but but I have high hopes for him this year, and I think he's someone that they could really, really use on that side of the ball, especially with um, Charles Aminahu, uh coming back from injury and, and then being a little thinner at that spot heading into this year. Okay, before we move on to the the one offensive guy that we know that you have probably copious amounts of data for, I, I'm going to kind of combine this with Felix and DK Uzama, Deuce Vaughn and Ben Sennett, guys. Obviously, Sennett, there's no information there because he has not played an NFL snap yet. Deuce Vaughn, maybe I, he had a handful last year, but not a ton. So, at what point do you start getting? the the data points where you can start to get information on these guys that you trust and and can kind of believe into where you know you guys are, are giving out some of your best bets this week on field vision if you're signed up and you can start to say with confidence okay Ben sent it over 35 and a half receiving yards like at what point will you get there to where you trust the information in, in terms of rookies we'll probably add prop bets in for rookies after week three uh that gives us a data set um, and, and those are based on matchup indexes. So if you go into our app right now, um, in addition to these player rankings that I'm talking about, the havoc and the threat, we'll have an opinion on basically every single player with a Vegas line, except for rookies, because we don't have any information to go off of from their side. We know like what the defenses might be doing and where field area advantages could be there. Um, so Senate, I would imagine he'll accumulate some action early in the season. And by week three, week four, you'll be able to go in if he has a Vegas line. And, and we do it that way just to basically uh, draw a line as to how many players we want to project. So if if he's uh, like involved enough that Vegas is putting an over-under on him, then we'll have a projection for him in our app. Um, and then same with Deuce Vaughn. Um, Deuce Vaughn did show up in the threat ratings a little bit, but there wasn't a whole lot there to go off of um, from last year. Uh, one guy. Who, who's been in the league a while that's a little bit further down the list in terms of like, but he plays on the same team as Ben Sennett now, Byron Pringle. His uh, threat rating is 57. Um, but one of the unique things we have in our app in the player rankings tab is basically like for every route that a receiver can run, uh, we have their percentile, their EPA percentile against the league. Uh, so you might be interested to know that Byron Pringle on scramble routes, and, and this kind of makes sense, spending some years with Patrick Mahomes and, and things like that and m scoring some touchdowns on broken plays. He's 89th percentile in the league uh, against the league on scramble routes and 73rd percentile on, on crossers. Uh, everything else falls off a little bit. But we have that, and we have, like, field area proficiency for every player as well. So uh, there's definitely some unique insights you can pull on various players. You can also look just for – players on your favorite NFL team, search it by game, things like that. But uh, uh, yeah, we can uh, we can get into the Tyler Lockett stuff if you want to see that. Yeah, well, yeah, that, that's probably what everybody's here for. I mean, we just had 
Kevin Lockett going to the K-State Sports Hall of Fame over the weekend. Sterling Lockett seeing the field. Uh, Lockett mania has never not been a thing in Manhattan, but it's definitely back, and everybody loves hearing about Tyler Lockett, who until DJ Reed had been the best K-Stater in the NFL for uh, a while after Jordy Nelson retired. So what can you tell us about Tyler Lockett? Yeah, so uh, just for some context, um, our threat ratings, you can kind of look at them as like a Madden rating. They we 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 scale them with the top player being 99. Justin Jefferson's a 99 amongst receivers, and then it goes down from there uh, based on the relative distance in raw threat. Uh, so Tyler Lockett heading into 2024 is a 72.4, uh, which is 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 not bad. That ranks him uh, 40th in the league, uh, but he's had some some seasons that are a lot better than that. Uh, it's weighted most towards the most recent seasons. And last year wasn't his best in terms of threat rating, but 2019, he was number 12 in the league. 2020, he was number 12 in the league. 2021, he was number eight in the league. And uh, you guys might find this interesting. Uh, we have like EPA ranks split out by field field area. So deep left, deep center, deep right, intermediate left, right, center, short left, right, center. In terms of the short right part of the field, not behind the line of scrimmage, but just past the line of scrimmage, basically a little hitch. Uh, Tyler Lock is number one in the entire league uh, in in um, in EPA generated in the short right area of the field. And uh, in terms of routes, the hitch, he's 99th percentile. So a couple of things you can look for and count on from Tyler Lockett is that he's going to line up on the right side. He's going to run some really good hitches. Uh, but also he's 90th percentile on out routes, 89th percentile on post routes, 79 uh, in the flat. So he does a lot of things really well and has for a very long time. Um, it'll be interesting to see this year. A lot of people are looking for the emergence of Jackson Smith and Jigba out of Ohio State going into his second year. Uh, but Tyler Lockett really held him off last year. Uh, it was still him and DK Metcalf with the top two options on that team. Uh, and And he's been doing it. For a long time, and and I would imagine he's still going to be a key piece on that Seattle offense with a new coaching staff in there. All right, so that's that's what there is for for the Cats uh, right now. We look forward to at the end of the year we can bring you on after the Dolphins decide that Tiny Hands Two is a bum and that Skylar Thompson needs to be the guy. We can talk about uh, Skylar and and what he's done to tear up the league. Uh, but before we let you out of here, we will uh, we'll throw some some Chiefs stuff your way. Uh, so, Drew, anything about your beloved Chiefs that you have a question on regarding how field vision works? I, I would. I think the the question that I have is, uh, hmm, like where does Rasheed Rice rank? Because he was only in the league for a year. So, like, wh where is he at in this? That's a that's a uh, a great question. I will I will admit to you guys that I do not have the rankings memorized yet, and I I prepared for the K State guys. But I, we do have a search function, so I am sure I can find Rasheed Rice in here. You're uh, good. I did, I did give you a lengthy list of guys that I had. I think I had to say if applicable because uh, I was realistic in that they, they may not have had a ton of snaps for you. So yes, I will uh, tell you this um, as I'm looking him up, and I, I got him pulling up here right now. Uh, his, his threat rating 67, actually just behind Tyler Lockett. I will tell you this: we did a profile on Rasheed Rice in the off season that you can find on our X account. Um, at Field Vision MI and Rasheed Rice's rookie year, believe it or not, he does damage in the same areas of the field and had really similar profiles to like a Debo Samuel type. Um, so Debo Samuel is a more established player who's done it for longer. But if Rasheed Rice takes the next step in his progression, that's the type of player we feel like he is, is, is a Debo Samuel. He was number one in the league in behind the line of scrimmage left. Uh, number four and number five, respectively, in middle and right behind the line of scrimmage. So he's going to do a lot of damage in the middle of the field underneath. Um, and he has a pretty neutral matchup um, against the Ravens this week. So we don't have a large opinion one way or the other on him. Um, but uh, we do have a large opinion on uh, Mark Andrews. We don't feel like he's going to have a very good game. So I, I don't know. I don't know if you guys are like – I know it sounds like Drew's a Chiefs fan. But with the Ravens yeah. being purple, I don't know if that means Mason automatically has to root for him or what the. No, 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 no. I, I actually, I'm not, I'm not a Chiefs fan, but uh, I am a fan of Patrick Mahomes' greatness. 
So I I do want good things to happen to the Chiefs. Well, specifically Mahomes, but it I can also play both sides. This is like how I am with United States, really soccer of any kind. I know enough about what's going on with the topic that I can be a chameleon and I can, you know, if things are going good, I can act like, oh, that's fun. That's fine. Doesn't bother me. But if things are going bad, I can also jump in. Uh, the thumbs up always just pops up whenever the hell it wants to. But I can also jump in and I can really stir the pot and kind of make fun of them. So, like, if the Chiefs lose on Thursday night, I'll probably send off some provocative tweet about Andy Reid. Well, I may not tweet it, but I definitely might send a text to some people trying to get him riled up. It, very easy to do that with John Kurtz. Uh, like, what was it? three years ago, three or four years ago, they lost the home opener to the Chargers. And then Andy Reid had to go to the hospital because he was dehydrated uh, after the game and didn't do his post-game media. Very easy to get John Kurtz just sucked in with uh, some some trash talk there. I'm like, I don't know, maybe the guy shouldn't have been wearing a jacket on the sideline when it's 100 degrees out. That's just me. Uh, but yeah, I, I can go both ways. So, But I did see the Mark Andrews thing. And uh it's a little scary for a guy that has taken Mark Andrews in his fantasy league this weekend. So I'm, I'm I'll, I hope that doesn't He's work out, but I did. I, I've got divided interest. I did also, I did also tail uh, what you guys said though, in the, in the betting realm. So we'll see how that goes for me. All right. Sounds good. All right. We well, like Sasha, I, 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 oh, well. go ahead. For the chiefs fans out there, we do like the chiefs this, uh, this Thursday to cover. So just thought I'd throw yeah, that out. There you go. That's, that's a good deal. Elliot both not a fan of the Chiefs covering, apparently, losing her mind. Uh, Sasha, thanks for coming on, telling us a little more about Field Vision. And uh, we may talk to you at the end of the season when you have good things to say about Deuce Vaughn, who is just going to you know, be the best running back in that Cowboys running back room that's just god-awful. Uh, not looking forward to that. So, Sasha, thank you, and we'll talk to you later. Yeah, thanks for having me, guys. All right, that is Sasha Bushka and Field Vision Sports. A little insight there on uh, how that works, and we'll talk uh, a little bit more uh, down the road with kind of how that ends up looking and everything else and maybe readdressing it as the season gets started. All right, moving on now, talking K-State, getting back to it. The Cats, they are, if I can figure out how to use our uh, – there we go. Talking Cats here. They moved to 17th in the AP poll. Uh only up one spot. Were you surprised by any of the results in the AP poll or how the Big 12 shook out? I mean, honestly, no. The AP poll kind of went about how I expected it to. Uh, Florida State is a hilarious uh, kind of fall from grace to be a top 10 team that ends up not even being in the, the first uh, full ranking because they've already lost twice. Uh, so that was funny. Um, LSU still being ranked that highly, I thought was a little strange, but you know, it's part of the brand that they have, I guess. Uh, and then, uh, Clemson, uh, still kind of be even being 25 to me is kind of silly, uh, because they were pretty non-competitive against Georgia, but really the whole thing, it's been one week. So everything was kind of about what I expected. Uh, it is interesting to note that. It, and it probably should have gone with how the games went that even though Oregon and Michigan both won, they still fell. Yeah, I, I understood uh, Oregon and kind of their drop that they had. Michigan makes sense. I did, you know, I don't know. I looked around and some of the ones that kind of surprised me is USC got a massive jump to number 10. I mean, or can we be certain that LSU is good enough to warrant a, 10 spot bump. That was a little crazy. Uh, and then I look around at some of the others and I don't really have many issues uh, with, with any of those out there. Although I did kind of wonder what dictated KU getting a three spot bump from where they were. Like that was a little confusing to me. Um, I guess it had maybe more so with others you didn't trust. And then it, it is also very funny to see Iowa just move up like a rocket four spots because they actually learned how to score the football. Uh, but K-State probably about right at number 17. And th honestly, K-State has to prove that they can get through this non-conference unbeaten before I really start to have a strong opinion one way or the other on if they should be higher or not. Boston College, I think, being that 27 was a little surprising to me uh, because 
I I don't know how well that yeah, Florida State line is going to That's just out. another one where you're evaluating them against a team that we we know or we are thinking could be not very good. So kind of fascinating there, but K-State checks in at number 17 in the AP poll. Moving on, talking a little game week action here. Tulane, the opponent, going to New Orleans. Second time K-State has played the Green Wave down there. And, uh, you know, I do this with every game, always checking the weather for like days in advance. And as we've gotten closer to uh, the game kicking off, looking to be mid-80s and kind of locked into that temperature-wise in New Orleans. But there is starting to be some rain in the forecast, really starting today, going all the way through Saturday. Uh, and it says AM showers for Saturday. It's going to be fascinating to see if that hangs around for K-State. And uh, looking like that's going to get close to pushing in the kickoff in first half if you look at some of the extended forecasts. How impactful do you think that wet weather would be in this game for K-State as opposed to also impacting Tulane? Does anybody get an advantage or disadvantage one way or the other? Honestly, I don't think that it's a huge advantage or disadvantage one way or the other uh, because I think that Tulane's main strength will be running the ball and, and wet weather and weather games kind of make you want to run even more than you do. And we know that K-State can run the ball really, really well as well. So I think that it probably doesn't impact one way or the other, but I think it's uh, a situation where you could probably see more mistakes. I mean, this is going to be Avery Johnson's first road start. It will be uh, Mensa for Tulane's second start ever and second just game ever. So I think that that could cause a little bit of problems there. But like overall, yeah, weather to me, unless there's 25 inches of snow in case it doesn't feel like tackling, it doesn't really affect or impact just one team. I mean, it might impact them in different ways, but both of these teams are pretty similar DNAs, I think. So I think that it's about the same. It's kind of just a wash. I would, the only thing that maybe concerns me here is that the, the passing game was not very encouraging in dry conditions on Saturday, and if you wanted to make an excuse, you would say, well, you know, it's pretty humid, a lot of sweat, so maybe not great grip of the ball. Well, you want to talk about sweat. Sweat is wet, and it's not going to help your hands, and rain is also wet and would not help your hands. So I think, if anything, uh, if the rain lingers and becomes a part of the game, uh, it'd be interesting to watch K-State's passing game, and you may not be able to get uh, a good read on it, or you get a read that says they cannot throw the ball uh, in adverse conditions in any form. So that would be the only thing is the passing game didn't look great already. Rain might impact that even more if it does hang around, but uh, it will be interesting to follow along with. And so everybody keep New Orleans uh, on your hourly weather and just keep locking in and looking. I trying to, let's see, go. I went through it earlier today and it looked like button up against a kickoff there would still be some rain hanging around so that'll be a fun time which the, you know there was some rain in columbia last year too on the road it will be a very wet drive on friday i will i will say that that is like a confirmed thing that's supposed yeah. to rain like the entire day yeah let's tomorrow. hope Derek We're young fine. knows how to use uh his <laughs> his mind microphone. yeah everything that he needs to to power through the weather there all right final thing Linebacker health for K-State coming into question. Asa Newsom did not play in the opener. Alec Marenko did not play in the opener. And Austin Moore was on a bit of a snap count. Uh, where does your optimism lie for those three linebackers in terms of them playing on Saturday at Tulane? And also, to what extent do they play on Saturday at Tulane? Yeah, I would lean more towards being optimistic about Austin Moore and Asa Newsom at this point. Um, Chris Klein was actually asked about those two specifically uh, Monday. I almost said Tuesday because just in the in the old habits, but I asked uh, Monday at the uh, press conference about uh, Asa Newsom and Austin Moore's health, and he said that they're both not long-term injuries, but feeling more optimistic uh, this week than he was last week. Um, Alec Marenko wasn't mentioned in the press conference by Chris Kleiman in that uh, question, or just nobody asked him about Alec Marenko in general. So kind of hoping to learn more uh, during the coordinator press conference uh, tomorrow. 
uh, because that that's a big deal because that could be somebody that that's somebody that Casey was really kind of relying on, and you don't want to lose somebody for an extended period of time already in a position group that was just decimated with injuries last year too. Yeah, it's you know we thought that the linebacker spot was going to be really strong, really deep, and that the health wasn't going to be a factor, and then all of a sudden you get butted up there right against the the start of the season, and now it's already starting to come into question. The good news is. None of it seems long term uh, currently, so it'll be interesting to follow along with that storyline as we get into Saturday. And for some of those guys, we'll be able to tell as soon as warm up start who's in pads and who's not. Uh, certainly, well, for, for, for some guys, we'll be able to tell because they'll either be in New Orleans true. or they won't. It's true. Yeah, it's a good point. Although non con games, you can you can try. You don't have the limits, right? I think you can travel. But I'm actually I don't know, not like, sure. I, I'm I think pretty that, sure that there, yeah, there oh, are yeah. limits for non-con, but yeah, it's still, but I mean. Some guys that are hurt, I would, if it's a long-term thing, I would imagine that they just won't even be there. Yeah. So it'll be fascinating to watch, and uh, we'll keep everybody posted on that over on KSO as the uh, week continues on. And certainly, DY's morning walkthrough will get everybody set as well with the latest information before the Cats and Tulane kick off at 11 a.m., on Saturday, they get the big nod on ESPN, so the second college game day is done. You'll go to New Orleans, and uh, it'll be Bob Wischusen and Lewis Riddick, uh, one of their top teams on ESPN, calling the K-State Tulane game this weekend. But that'll do it for us today in your K-State headlines. We'll be back again tomorrow. D.Y. and I will recap what was said by the K-State coordinators, Connor Riley and Joe Klanderman. And then we will have your Friday game preview for you as well. So for Drew Galloway, I'm Mason Vo. Thanks for watching and listening to K-State Online. Back again tomorrow with your coordinator, Cliff.